The Sky Knight was a dated plane even before it saw use in Korea, and by the end of the war, it was totally obsolete. Aeronautics was progressing in leaps and bounds. New fighters were breaking the sound barrier and mounting much more sophisticated radar systems, far better than the archaic APQ-35. The squadron that had made a name with the Sky Knight, VMA-513, dropped its Knight suffix when it traded its Sky Knights for the Douglas Sky Ray, a supersonic all-weather interceptor. As it was slowly brought out of combat service, some 200 Sky Knights were available for new jobs. It was becoming ever more vital to know the positions of enemy radar installations, communications infrastructure, and especially surface-to-air missile systems. The Sky Knight was recognized as an ideal candidate for this kind of reconnaissance mission, as the removal of its radar left ample space for electronic surveillance equipment and radar jammers. One F-3D2 would be modified in 1955 and equipped with a panoramic surveillance radar, direction finding and analysis equipment, and a pair of 200 watt noise jammers. Two of its cannons were removed, with two remaining to give the aircraft some form of defense and to avoid weight distribution issues. The plane was modified at MCAS El Toro by two electronic warfare veterans, Warrant Officer Joe Bauer and Master Sergeant E.R. Grimes. The prototype was soon joined by a second test aircraft, and the pair were evaluated and refined at the Naval Ordnance Test Station China Lake and the White Sands Missile Range. They proved satisfactory, and soon orders to convert 35 Sky Knights to F3DTQs were received. Sometime later, they were redesignated EF 10B in accordance with the new Air Force designation system. The first of the modified aircraft were received at the very end of 1956 and delivered to the Marine Squadron VMC J 3 with additional deliveries being made to VMC J-1 through 3 in the following years. The first new deployment of the EW Sky Knight began in July 1958, with VMC J-3 rebasing to MCAS Iwakuni, Japan. While its original mission was to help with defensive electronic warfare training, it was not long until they were recruited into the peacetime aerial reconnaissance program and used as a surveillance tool against the Soviets, the Chinese, and the DPRK in East Asia. Under the codename Sharkfin, the Sky Knights flew offshore patrols to gather electronic data on radar stations and communication networks. Among the most crucial patrols were those around the Soviet Far East, though their patrols ranged all over the region, with four deployments spanning from Tainan, Taiwan to Misawa in northern Japan. With VMC J3 engaged in its Sharkfin operations in Asia, VMC J2 was working closer to home. Their job was to monitor Cuban military expansion flying patrols dubbed Smoke Rings, beginning in 1960. Unlike the relatively easy job of monitoring early warning radars in East Asia, Soviet technicians in Cuba were keen to keep their work under wraps and shut down their systems if they were being surveilled. This was quickly noticed by the patrolling marine aviators who soon learned to fly under radio silence and operate from less conspicuous airfields, particularly those in the Bahamas and Jamaica. Their efforts paid off, as in the next year they detected the operation of a P-20 token radar system, used as a ground control radar for MiGs. The smoke rings patrol work built up considerably as the situation in Cuba escalated after the failed invasion in the Bay of Pigs, which would lead to a significant Soviet military buildup, culminating in the deployment of ballistic missiles to the island. When the Cuban Missile Crisis began, the Marine's job would be as to act as radar jamming support, should the crisis turn into an open conflict. Thankfully, they were never called upon for this, though in the years to follow, they still patrol the island to keep a picture of the situation and to give new crews practical experience before they were deployed to Vietnam. While the Marine Sky Knight pilots were snooping along the seas of East Asia and flying rings around Cuba, the US had become embroiled in a brutal conflict of Indochina, which followed the end of the French control over Vietnam. Much the same as Korea, this war between two heavily militarized sides would see widespread destruction and a massive technological arms race. Air power would be a major component to the US strategy, both seeing its traditional use and as a way to offset the considerable numerical disadvantage on the ground. It also proved a way to get around the DMZ between the North and South, which was created to prevent a direct invasion from either side. The Communist Democratic Republic of Vietnam would weather a brutal air campaign with help from their patrons the Soviet Union, and the People's Republic of China. At first, they had little more than light anti-aircraft artillery and a token air force. But as was the case in Korea, the Soviet Union and PRC would step in and supply the People's Army of Vietnam with the equipment and advisors needed to build a formidable defense against American air power. 
The Soviets would provide aircraft, radar systems, and training personnel to build the Vietnamese People's Air Force an effective GCI system to intercept American bombers. However, the Soviet Union would begin to supply the more advanced, supersonic MiG-19 and the much more modern MiG-21. As impressive as the MiG-21 was, it did not cause the shakeup that the deployment of the SA-2 surface-to-air missile did, which the Vietnamese anti-air troops began training on in 1965. The system was robust, easily transportable by truck, and effective for its day, with the Soviet Union supplying 95 batteries and over 7,000 missiles during the war. The triple layer of defenses, in which lower altitudes were covered by flak, higher altitudes by SAMs, and the MiGs, which were effective in both areas, proved to be a formidable challenge to American aircraft over northern Vietnam. However, there was a unified weakness that all of these systems shared and could be exploited, they all relied on ground radar support to function. The Sky Knights would join a staggering number of aircraft involved with signals reconnaissance and jamming efforts over Vietnam. Among those providing direct support during Operation Rolling Thunder, it was one of only two major electronic warfare aircraft, the other being the EB-66. Pitted against them was a fledgling but quickly growing network of North Vietnamese SAM batteries and ground control stations for MiGs. VMCJ-1 were deployed to the airfield at Zha Nang in April of 1965 under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Otis Corman, with six EF-10Bs and a complement of 93 men. While it might seem odd that such an old aircraft was being brought in for such an important job, both the Navy and Air Force liked an aircraft that could really replace it. While the Navy was to receive the cutting-edge EA-6A electric intruder, technical delays would see it deployed at the end of 1966, as it was, the Sky Knight, now known almost universally as the Whale, was to provide an important role in plugging the gap until more advanced aircraft became available. The Whales flew their first missions on April 19th, flying radar reconnaissance flights through Indochina. Their findings allowed them to plot the network of North Vietnamese early warning and fire control radars near the side of the DMZ. As the month came to a close, the situation in the air took a turn when MiGs downed two F-105s. In response, the whales were sent to suppress North Vietnamese ground control radars. Equipped with ALQ-39 jammers, configured to counter the enemy's early warning and flak-directing radars, they flew ahead of strike groups, jamming and dropping chaff to confuse MiG ground directors. The EF-10s were soon in high demand to support Navy and Air Force operations, and it was not long until they were working at a 300% higher rate than they were in peacetime. This was later decreased to 200%, but the crews and planes were still operating near their limits. DMZ patrols and jamming support continued routinely until the 24th of July, 1965, when an F-4C Phantom was shot down by an SA-2. While previously, the sites were off-limits out of concerns that killing a Soviet advisor might escalate the conflict, strikes against two SAM sites were authorized three days after the Phantom was downed. The mission, Spring High, involved the use of all six EF-10s acting in support of a strike force of 48 F-105s. The whales flew as screens for the F-105s, jamming the radars used by FLAX, SAMs, and MiGs. None of the strike aircraft were lost to radar-guided assets, but six were lost to low-level anti-aircraft fire. One of the early challenges faced in these missions was the lack of a dedicated escort, which proved concerning, as the defenseless whales were typically the first in and last out. While none were ever lost to MiGs, air crews were often concerned enough to set up informal escort flights with other Navy units. Such was the case with Chuck Houseman, who organized an escort flight with a squadron of Marine aviators who flew F-8 Crusaders from the carrier USS Oriskany. MiGs aside, the greatest concern were typically fuel-related, as the planes were operating at the limits of their range and carried jammers and chaff dispensers on their wing pylons, where they could otherwise carry more fuel. By the end of the summer of 65, the SA-2 threat continued to evolve. Batteries sprouted up around the north, and their operators were honing their expertise on this new weapon. Facing the SAMs would require a new set of tactics that blended a mix of electronic deception and fast, aggressive flying. Named Wild Weasel, these strike aircraft were given the dangerous task of venturing into defenses designed to kill them and tear them down. In this mission, the whale was to play a vital role early on. They would accompany the flights of F-100s and later F-105s, destined to attack the site directly and provide them with vital support. At this early chapter in anti-SAM tactics, most of the strike aircraft lacked the radar warning equipment that gave them an alert when they were being targeted. Until the devices began arriving in mass next year, one of the whale's most important jobs was simply to tell them when they were being targeted, 
and when they would need to go evasive. The whales performed well, but the limits of the aircraft and its equipment became apparent when they suffered their first and only loss to the SAM batteries. In March 1966, the SAMs would finally catch one of the jamming aircraft, forcing a change in tactics. Following the incident, the EF-10 was no longer permitted within 20 miles of a SAM site, and its mission area was effectively pushed out over the coast. This new patrol area would see them mostly supporting naval operations. The whale's new task was to fly in strike aircraft towards the coast and screen their approach with jammers. They would prove essential to the point that the missions would be called off if no supporting EF-10s were available. The whales would fly a much less conventional mission over Laos and Cambodia, where they aided in the project known as Blind Bat. In an effort to curtail the supply line known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the USAF outfitted several C-130H cargo aircraft with massive night vision devices. Using these, they hoped to spot the faint lights emitted by trucks and bicycle lamps as they made their nocturnal journey south to deliver supplies to the forces of the Viet Cong guerrilla fighters in the south. When the C-130 spotted something, it dropped illumination flares over it, and whatever was exposed would be attacked by the pair of B-57 Canberras, which trailed the spotter. The fourth aircraft of the troop was an EF-10, there to protect the others from radar-guided AAA. They flew off the wing of the C-130, with the two bombers following behind them. While they were never exposed to much of a threat from the ground, the whale crews who flew these missions considered them the most dangerous during their entire combat tour. It's understandable, considering all four aircraft flew in blacked-out liveries with a single navigation light atop the C-130 to provide reference between them. Poor weather and moonless nights were also common, as the porters along the trail knew they'd be the hardest to spot in such conditions. Little was improved during a successful mission, as the flares and exploding ammunition along the trail ruined the pilot's night vision, leaving them to readjust as they turned for home. By the end of 1966, the whale's replacement began to arrive in growing numbers. The EA-6A electric intruder was superior in every regard, but it proved unreliable as it went through a rough teething period. The first arrived at the end of October, ahead of a series of strike operations towards the end of the year. A massive number of strikes were launched starting December 2, 1966, under the largest EW umbrella so far, consisting of six intruders and ten whales. While the intruders would handle the more dangerous work, the whales could cover transiting strike aircraft and monitor and jam the growing number of radars for enemy AAA batteries. Even into the autumn of the following year, the EA-6s were still proving challenging to keep serviceable. It proved frustrating enough that the Corps decided to upgrade its whales to bridge the gap until the intruders' readiness rates improved. The Super Whale would feature a new broadband radar receiver, an ALR-27 radar warning receiver, and an improved panoramic display for detecting and classifying hostile radar systems. The new suite radically improved the crew's ability to classify enemy systems and gave instantaneous missile launch warnings. The first of the modified planes was delivered in March, and crews soon flew them on their now familiar missions. The eight super whales of VMCJ-1 continued to fly until September 1969, having been fully replaced by more modern aircraft. By the end of its service, it was almost unique in its age, and its pilots often remarked on the fact that few airmen were assigned to something so eccentric. It was an aircraft designed with World War II-era technology, and it made its pilots well aware of that fact. There were so few of them that the training materials for the aircraft were sparse, and no formal training program existed, so learning to fly and use the aircraft systems was an on-the-job affair. Many airmen felt pride in having mastered such an unconventional plane, especially one that flew quite well. This concludes our video on the EF-10. What are your thoughts on this pioneering aircraft? Feel free to share your thoughts on this unique vehicle in the comments section. As always, we here at the Plane Encyclopedia appreciate your love and support, so feel free to leave a like and subscribe to know exactly when new content rolls out. If you'd like to buy us some fuel to keep us going, visit Patreon or PayPal. Until next time, stay tuned and keep following our updates.